All right, welcome folks to section three, one of the most important sections on exposure controls. In here, we're gonna be going over everything to get the best possible exposure. We'll be talking about all the different options in the mode dials, which means we'll talk about shutter speeds, apertures, ISOs, as well as a number of other tools for getting just the right exposure. All right, the mode dial on the top of the camera, that is how you control what shutter speeds, apertures, and everything else that's gonna be used in a certain way to get the exposure on the camera. So let's dive in and talk in detail about what's going on here. So we're gonna start with the easiest and work our way up to the more manual settings. Auto, or the green full auto, is the full automation on the camera. Now, to actually get the full automation, there are two other little things that you need to make sure you have right, otherwise everything's gonna go wrong. Uh, first up is make sure you, you are in the camera mode, not the video mode or the movie mode on the camera. So that little collar on the back of the camera, make sure that it's not in the movie mode, that you have it in that camera mode because we want to shoot still photos. And then next up, on most all Nikon lenses, you're going to have a manual focus and autofocus switch. And if that's in manual focus, well, that's going to cause a problem if you don't know that you're supposed to manually focus. And so for simplicity, in most cases, you want to leave that in the A setting there so that it will automatically focus for you. I'm a big fan of manual focusing. I think it's great. You just need to know which mode you're in. So that kind of completes the steps to making sure that your camera is in a full auto mode. Now, when you are in the full auto mode, first up, the camera is going to be setting shutter speeds, apertures, and ISO. So all the basic exposure controls to make sure that you're going to get a quote unquote normal photo. It should be good enough that pretty much anything you point the camera at, it's going to get a reasonably good photo of that. Now, there are some downsides to this. Uh, main one being in my mind is that it's going to limit certain features and access to menu items because this very, very simple mode is designed kind of as a foolproof mode. They don't want you to make mistakes. Uh, I think for a lot of the more serious photographers, this is a mode they're not going to use, or the only time they'll use it is when they're handing their camera over to somebody who doesn't know how to operate the camera that needs to take photos. That might be their kid or their cousin or a stranger on the street, here, take my photo um, type of situation. And so for most people who've bought this camera, this is not the main area that they're going to use the camera. It's there for convenience for other purposes. So. On the top of your camera, let's uh, get the setup for a few things here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and turn it to the full auto mode there. And there are a number of features, and we're going to go through most of these later on in the class. If you press the I button on the back of the camera for some of the basic features. And so if we look right now, uh, if we press the I button back here, there's going to be a whole menu here of items. And as I say, we're not going to do this right now. We'll talk about this in the I menu section, uh, some of these items are grayed out because as I mentioned, there are child safety locks on this particular feature that does not allow you into those particular settings. If you were to change it to one of the other settings on the mode dial, then some of those other options would open up in there. So for just ultimate ease in shooting, yeah, the auto mode is just a nice, quick, easy way to get basic exposures, you don't really have any control over what's going on. The camera's gonna take control over everything. So let's take it, take it up a notch. All right, the program mode. It's actually very similar to the auto mode in the sense that it's setting shutter speeds and apertures, and it's gonna be giving you a good exposure for all the other settings and lighting that you're working in. However, it doesn't have the child safety locks on the menus and other features of the camera. So uh, you can go in and you can change any of the different things that we're going to be talking about later on in this class. The program mode is good when you do want to have kind of pretty simple operation, but you still want to be able to jump in and maybe make a change. Now, the shutter speeds and apertures that the camera is setting can be seen through the viewfinder or in the back of the camera on the LCD. You'll see that your camera is in the P for program mode, and then you'll see your shutter speeds and your apertures. And it's good to keep an eye on these numbers to make sure that they are appropriate for the types of photos that you want to take. Now, one of the nice things about program is that there is something called flexible program. 
by turning that main control dial on the camera, you can adjust the shutter speeds and apertures into a different combination. Now, no matter what you do, it's always going to be letting in the correct amount of light. It's just changing the different values so that you can have different options depending on whether you want faster shutter speeds or more depth of field um, or what aspect you are trying to get set for a particular photograph. So let me show you real quickly on this one. So first thing we'll do is we'll change our camera from full auto to the program mode. Press halfway down to wake our camera up. And if I turn the dial, uh, you'll actually, let's look down here at the bottom. We can see that we're at a 60th of a second at F4. Now, uh, just kind of a, something else, just foreshadowing into what we're gonna talk about here in a moment. The ISO auto is blinking, which means this is now activated. It is now using auto ISO. And I actually do not want to do that because right now, if I turn this main control dial, this does not do the flexible program that I talked about. Uh, so what I want to do in this case is I'm going to turn off the ISO auto setting and we're not going to worry exactly about what I'm doing right now. Actually, I'm going to turn it off and then I'm going to raise our ISO to a reasonable level here in the studio. And so we can see here that we are at 1 200th of a second at F4. And if I turn the dial this direction, nothing happens. And if I turn it this way, eventually it starts turning and I can set it to F22 and I get more depth of field. I could set it to say F4 for shallower depth of field. I could look at shutter speeds and say, nope, I want a slower shutter speed. I could dial down there. Now the problem with this mode is if you get something really specific dialed in, let's say I want a 60th of a second. Okay, we're at a 60th of a second, great. Well, if I move the camera around, depending on the light, it may change. And so it's changing the aperture right now. Uh, depending on if we get in real dark there, it changed the shutter speed and aperture on me. It's not locking in any of those particular settings that you have in. It's just kind of keeping you in that ballpark, you might say, of where you're at. And so this could be a fairly simple system for just deciding on the fly, oh, I want to do this right now. And then you get that set up. Now, if we come back to the camera and we take a look at it, we notice that it's kind of stayed there. So let's, uh, let's make a change and let's go to a really small aperture like F22 and say we take a photo there. Okay, that's great. Now, at some point later, we decide that we want to go take another photo, but this is more of a general photo, not one stop down to F22. When we come back to the camera, it's still at F22. So this feature is kind of stuck in there until we change it again. You have to remember to change it back to a quote unquote more normal setting. Let's get this changed, there we go. Uh, back to a more normal setting for what you're doing. So it's a handy mode. It's not most people's favorite mode, uh, depending on what you are doing. All right, next up. Shutter priority. So here, obviously, we get control of the shutter. You can set whatever shutter speed you want, and the camera will figure out the correct exposure by adjusting the aperture. All right, so this can be very good for times when you know you need a very specific fast shutter speed, for instance, for capturing an eagle coming into a river to grab a fish. You could also choose a very slow shutter to show the motion of water moving through a river. And so here you get to select shutters, the camera will figure out the apertures for you. Now the thing that you need to be careful about here is if you choose a shutter speed for which there is no appropriate aperture, it's quite possible that you can select a shutter speed where you don't have the appropriate aperture and that aperture is gonna blink at you to warn you that, hey, I don't have the aperture that I need here you need to either select a different shutter speed or you need to put a different lens on this camera that has a faster aperture um, or possibly change something with the ISO. Something needs to change to fix the problem. Let's take a look at this. All right, so on our camera, we will change it to shutter priority up here on top. And we have a very fast shutter speed. Let's go to a normal shutter speed like a 60th of a second. And right here we have a 60th of a second and we can shoot a photo and that's probably going to be a fine photo let's play it back yep looks like a fine photo 
Now, if we want to change to a faster shutter speed, we can do that. We can go up to 125th of a second, 160th, 200th. But as soon as we try to go to 250th of a second, you'll notice that the F4 is blinking down here. And over on the right-hand side is the exposure indicator. It's going to be a little different location up in the viewfinder, but you'll see it there as well. And if we just choose faster and faster shutter speeds, well, it's just blinking, letting us know that that picture is going to be dark. Well, what if we just say, tough luck, I want to shoot the photo anyway. Well, the camera will allow you to shoot the photo. And when we play that photo back, yeah, that's the dark one. This is the normal exposure. Here's the dark one that we just took. It allows you to make a mistake. You're kind of getting into the manual world here where you're allowed to make your own mistakes. And so be aware of anything that's blinking in there because that generally means that something is wrong. And so, as I say, you can change your shutter speed to a slower shutter speed. You can put on a different lens that has a faster aperture if you have one, or you can change your ISO. And we'll talk about ISO here in a little bit. All right, next up is aperture priority. So this is very much like the shutter priority mode, but you get control of the apertures rather than the shutter speeds. This can be handy when you want to stop your aperture down really small so that you can have great depth of field for like a landscape type shot. Or maybe you want to isolate a particular subject and show really shallow depth of field to really draw your viewer's attention to that one particular item in there. And so in here, you get to set your apertures and it is possible, but much less likely that you are not going to have an appropriate shutter speed for the amount of light that you have. Let's give this a try. All right, so we're going to change our camera to aperture priority. And currently we have F4 set on our camera at 200th of a second. Let's change our aperture by turning the front dial. Remember that one. And we can change it down to F22. And we have an appropriate shutter speed at 1 8th of a second. Let's get all the way down there. And 1 6th of a second, take a photo. Play that photo back, it comes out looking pretty good. Let's go to the other extreme on apertures, which is F4. Take a photo, play that back. Yep, that one looks good. So what's going on here is that there is a limited number of apertures that you can choose on any camera, especially this one. Uh, but shutter speeds, there's a much wider variety of options that you can go to. So with apertures, it's very safe because pretty much any aperture you have, there's probably an appropriate shutter speed. However, if you start with shutter speeds, there's not always an appropriate aperture right away. You may need to make some other settings adjustments there. So I find the aperture priority mode slightly preferable in that regard just because there's less potential problems using that mode. However, just like shutter priority, you do need to keep an eye on your settings, your shutter speed and your aperture. And so what are you setting and what is the result with the other setting? when you're in these aperture and shutter priority modes. All right, next up is full on manual. This is where you get to set everything yourself, shutter speeds and apertures. Quick side note, you can set ISO to manual in a particular number, or you can set it to auto if you want in here. Now, the reason I like manual is I like consistent results. So when I am set up in a situation where I have consistent lighting over a period of time, and I want to vary my composition and change lenses and do all sorts of different things, I get consistent lighting because if you have the same shutter speeds and apertures and the light's not changing, you're going to get consistent exposures. I also like manual exposure under tricky lighting situations. There can be situations that are either really bright or really dark or just odd for a wide variety of reasons where the automatic exposure isn't returning the results exactly as you want them. And so with manual exposure, I'll usually take a look at the light meter, work with that for a bit, do a couple of test shots, and then kind of narrow in exactly what I want. Now, while you are in manual exposure, you're going to be able to set your shutter speed. So let's talk about those for just a moment. Now, your standard shutter speeds will range from a fast of 1 8,000th of a second down to 30 seconds. Now, the ones I'm listing here on screen are what I would consider full step shutter speeds. They double or cut in half with each one. And you can actually set third stops in here. It just kind of clutters up the screen so I don't show them. They're perfectly legitimate. Set them all you want. I'm just not going to be talking about them 
here in the particular class. And so they're, they're in there. Now, if you dial down beyond 30 seconds, you can go to bulb, which is a long time exposure. And it is where the shutter stays open for as long as your finger is pressed on the shutter release. Now you can set up a 31 second exposure, a 32, a 60 second, a 15 minute exposure, as long as you want. Now the actual practice of pressing down on the shutter release of the camera, not highly recommended. Uh, this is where you'd want to get one of the electronic cable releases so that you're not actually bumping or vibrating or moving the camera in any way during a long exposure. So that's one of your options for doing a long time or night exposure. The other option you have is something called time, which is very similar but subtly different. In this case, it is one press to start the exposure and then another press to stop it. And so it depends on what you're doing and how long you feel comfortable pressing the button on the camera as to which one is best. Um, they're both there for a reason. And so these are only going to be available in the manual mode. And then finally, there's going to be an X1 over 200. And this is flash synchronization. This is the fastest shutter speed that you can use flash. For many people working with this camera in a studio environment with strobe lighting, they might want to have their camera at the fastest shutter speed. And this allows you to kind of get all the, get the dial way at the end where it's less likely to get bumped into the wrong exposure um, and it because it's at the end and you can have it set up for one two hundredth of a second. So let's just take a quick look through our shutter speeds. We will go ahead and make the change on the top of the camera to a manual exposure. Now our shutter speeds are going to be done on the back dial, the main command dial of this camera. Let's change my apertures here for a moment so we can go down to some very long shutter speeds. So you'll see that we'll go down to 30 seconds. I'm going to put my hand over here so we can see this a little bit more clearly. So there's our 30 seconds. We can go down to bulb, which is as long as we want to keep our finger on the shutter release. Time, one press to start, one to end. And there's our flash sync of one over two hundredth of a second. And I'm going to go ahead and bring it back up into the normal range in here. Now, if you do want to do those bulb or time exposures, that's a great tool to use when you are experimenting with nighttime photography. Here we are working with some light trails from the cars driving down the freeway. This is about a 30, 60 second exposure in here. Now, when setting your manual exposures, you're going to be using the light meter or the light indicator, which is going to show you whether you're underexposed, overexposed, or properly exposed. These are divided up into little segments to know, let you know exactly how far over or under you are. And so the bigger notches are full stop increments, and it'll show you three stops over, three stops under, but it also shows you third stops so that you can be very precise about your settings in here. If it is way off to the extremes, you'll get an arrow that indicates that you are more than three stops over or under exposed. If you are setting a manual exposure, generally recommended that you try to get your settings adjusted to get an even exposure to start with. I recommend taking a test photo, looking at that photo, seeing if it looks the way that you would like it to. Some types of images require you to overexpose or underexpose from what the camera's recommendation is. The camera's recommendation is generally pretty good, but it's not always perfect, that's for sure. And so sometimes you want to have a little under and sometimes you want to have a little over with this exposure indicator. It really depends on the type of subject you're shooting. So that is your manual exposure. Let's go ahead and just kind of set that up and do a manual exposure here. We do have our camera in the manual exposure mode. Let's just zoom in a tad bit here. And right now, let's go ahead and pick one of these settings uh, that might be important to us. Let's just say we wanted to be at F8. So I'm going to change my front dial to be F8. Uh, now I'm going to change my shutter speed. You can see that it first off looks overexposed just by the way the screen looks, but the indicator over here on the right hand side indicates that we are overexposed. This indicator works up and down and the indicator in the viewfinder works left and right. They're both doing the same thing. Look for the plus and minus. So I'm going to change my exposure to make it a little bit darker and you can see this indicator coming down towards zero. All right, so that's a stop overexposed. 
And there we are at even exposure. And so we can shoot our photo there, we can zoom around, we can move the composition, and it all stays exactly the same exposure, which is very nice in there. Now, if we thought, you know what, this, uh, this cabinet is white, maybe we need to overexpose a little bit. We could choose to adjust our shutter speeds a little bit to say overexpose by two thirds of a stop, or we could choose to overexpose with our aperture and say, you know what, that's our preferred exposure. It's not what the camera is recommending, but it's our preferred exposure. And so it's just a matter of working with that. Now ISO will also be involved. We haven't really talked about it yet, but yes, that is one of the third settings for controlling the exposure. All right, next up is user one, two, and three. And so these are user favorite settings. And so what you can do is you can set the camera up in a manner that you think it's gonna be very practical to work with for up to three different situations. You set the whole camera up, then you go into the menu setting. It's gonna be in the setup menu, save user setting, and you're gonna save that to either U1, U2, or U3. And that's gonna allow you to switch very quickly to a whole set of different settings that you have pre-selected in there. Let's go ahead and let's get our camera programmed for a couple of different settings in here. First up on top, I'm gonna to move my camera into aperture priority. This is just kind of like a base simple setting that I like to have. Um, I'm gonna set the ISO. Normally I'd set it at 100, but I'm just gonna set it at 200 here. I'm gonna set the aperture to F8. And just to do a few more things, I'm gonna press the I button to get into the I menu. And I'm going to, let's, uh, let's turn the motor drive on low. And I'm gonna change it to continuous focusing. And let's, let's just call that good now. So I'm gonna hit the menu and I'm gonna dive into the setup menu, the wrench, and the second item in is called save user settings. I'm gonna to go to the right in here, and you can see the three options, pretty obvious here. I wanna save this to U1, so we're gonna to go to U1, I'm gonna to go to the right, and I am gonna press OK, because I wanna save everything that I have, I wanna save everything I have here with the camera, and this is gonna be all the settings on the outside, the I menu and including the menu here. I haven't done any changes, but it's gonna save whatever, whatever I might have set in there, and I'm gonna save this in there. Okay, that's it, I'm done. Uh, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save a second one, and I'm gonna change this one to shutter priority on the mode dial on top. We're gonna to take the motor drive to high speed in this particular case. Uh, let's uh, change the ISO to something really fast, 3200. We're gonna change the shutter to something faster. Let's see if we can get up to 500th of a second. Okay, we're at 500th of a second. All right, so let's go lock this in as save user setting. I'm gonna go to the right, come down to U2 to the right, and I'm gonna pr press OK to save that setting. All right, that's saved in there. Now I kind of want to get the camera set back to normal. Uh, let's see, I was on program, so I'll change that up there. Uh, we'll change the, let's go into the I menu and change a few of these things back. We'll go back to AFS, and we're gonna talk all about this stuff later on in the class, but just getting things back to normal, you might say. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna hit the display button a couple of times. There we go. Now we can kind of see how the camera is set up. And we can see we're in AFS, we're in single shot. Um, let's get our ISO. Let's get that set down to 100 for right now. So let's just say this is our base setting on our camera where we manually like to work with it. And we suddenly decide, oh, I wanna use user setting one. I go up to the mode dial on the top of the camera. I set it to user setting one. And if you look on the back of the camera, we have put this one at ISO 200, it's at F8, autofocus continuous, single shot mode, and if I decide to turn it to the U2 mode, boom, it's in shutter priority at 500th of a second, continuous focus, 
And so our camera is now also at ISO 3200. And so it has been set up to be very different in that regard. Now, there's a variety of reasons why you might want to do this. I could see a landscape photographer who has everything landscapey set to U1, but they also like to do birds in flight, which they happen to do when they're also out in the landscape. And they got a lot of different changes on the camera that they want to make to get from one to the other. Well, by flipping the dial from U1 to U2, you immediately go from landscape mode to birds in flight mode. And you could have dozens of different changes uh, on your camera ready for that particular situation. So very handy if you have some situations that you have a lot of different settings that you like in order to shoot that style of photography. So encourage you to take some time now to kind of figure out what that might be, set them all up, and then go ahead and save them to U1, 2, and 3. So there you go, folks. That's your mode dial and all of the features on it. All right, we were talking about ISO, so let's get into it and talk about it here. So ISO is the sensitivity of the sensor. The native sensitivity of this particular sensor is ISO 100. That is where it is at its best. If you want the absolute best quality, ISO 100 is where you'll want to be. If, however, you need faster shutter speeds, and that lets in less light, and you need to kind of crank up the brightness on the sensor, well, you can set a higher setting on the ISO. And it will go up to 51,200, and then it could actually go beyond that up to 102,000, and it's what Nikon calls high one. And so these are the full stop increments that you can go in. And the problem with going up to a very high ISO is, of course, noise. And so if you have noise in an image, it's going to show up as kind of a pixelated area where it looks like grain from the days of film. Let's go ahead and take a look at a little test that I ran on this camera. So we're going to magnify a small portion of it, blow it up, and look at it at different ISO settings. And if you can't see the screen very clearly, I can just tell you right here from my perspective, everything up to 1600 does look very clean. 100 is the best. The problem with 50 is that it doesn't have as much dynamic range as it does in 100. It's, um, it's not a big difference, but it's not as good as 100. So if you can use 100, that's the best way to go. Bump it up as you need to. Looking at the higher ISOs in this particular case, well, clearly high one, which is 102,000, is very noisy here, does not look very good. And there's a bit of a color shift going on there that just doesn't look very good. You generally don't want to go there unless you absolutely have to. I think stepping down to around 25,000 improves the quality quite a bit, but there's a big change between 6,400 and 25,000. And so it's the same rule as always. You want to keep the ISO as low as possible. I think up to 6,400, you're doing pretty good on this camera. Uh, 25,000 in kind of some more extreme scenarios, um, and it does get pretty weak at those very high-end levels up there. So the ISO, uh, once again, is one of these buttons that you need to press down as you turn the button, the, the dial on the back of the camera. And so you'll press down on the ISO and turn the dial on the back in order to adjust the setting on that. If, however, you press the ISO button and turn the front dial, that will turn the auto ISO on and off. It's not quite as easy. I gotta, it's not as easy to use which fingers I'm using there, um, but it's something that probably doesn't get turned on and off for most people quite as much as just adjusting the ISO setting itself. Now, if you wanna get in and set the particulars of how auto ISO works, you can go into the photo shooting menu and you can go in and adjust some of those different settings. So let me just show you a little bit more about this. All right, so currently if I press the ISO button, I can change it from 3200, let's say down to 800. If I simply wanna to go to auto ISO, I can turn the front dial on the camera and you can see where the auto pops on and shows you that it is now in the auto mode. If we were to dive into the menu settings, and we're gonna go over to the camera up there, and we're gonna look for ISO sensitivity. It's a couple pages in, I think. Oh, I think I went past it. 
I missed it there at the top of that second page, ISO sensitivity settings. You can come in here and you can select which number, and that's the same basically as pressing the ISO button on the top of the camera. Under auto ISO, you can turn it on and off, and that's the same as pressing the button and turning the front dial. You can choose the maximum sensitivity, the maximum sensitivity if you have a flash attached and turned on, and you can also choose a minimum shutter speed. We'll talk more about these particulars when we get into the menu settings here. Uh, but this is a great way for you to set up auto ISO so it works really well if you do want to use it in some situations. Next up, let's talk about exposure compensation. Normally when the camera is in a automated or semi-automated mode, the camera always wants to give you a correct exposure according to what its light meter thinks is going on with the light. And generally it's pretty good. It's very close to the mark. But sometimes it's not exactly what you want. And this is where exposure compensation allows you to jump in and make an adjustment. So by pressing this button and turning the back dial, that main command dial on the camera, you can adjust the settings. Now you can also do it with the front dial. It's not nearly as easy, but it can be done if that's easier for your hands to reach to those buttons and dials. Now in here, the idea is, is that you can choose to make your picture a little bit darker or make it a little bit lighter according to the needs of that particular photograph. Some images look better dark, some look better light. Now you'll notice you're changing this by the exposure indicator or the exposure value, depending on whether you're looking through the viewfinder or the back of the camera. So if you were gonna do something kind of notably brighter, it would be maybe one stop brighter. If you wanted to have it you know, quite significantly darker, it might be on the minus two exposure side, and that's what it would look like on those indicators. Normally though, you leave it in the middle of the markers there at zero. Now this is normally gonna be used with program mode, shutter priority, and aperture mode, but you can use it in the manual mode to fool the light meter. So let me just show you a little bit more about this. All right, I'm gonna put my camera in aperture priority mode, which is a semi-automated mode. I'm gonna hit the display button so we can see what the heck is going on here. And the camera in aperture priority is giving us a nice looking aperture. But if we said, you know what, I'd like something a little bit lighter, I'm gonna press down on the plus minus, and maybe I want it overexposed image. And so it's showing down here, plus one in yellow as I press the button. And then over here on the exposure indicator, it's also indicating a plus one exposure. We can make it darker if we want. And so it's pretty easy in this case. Now you always wanna reset it back to zero when you're done, because you don't want that inadvertently left someplace that you don't want. Now, I'm gonna change the camera to manual mode, and we get to set everything ourselves. So let's go ahead and just set a proper exposure for this lighting conditions and here. So I'm gonna open it up to F4. I'm gonna use a slower shutter speed to let in more light, and We'll say over here, if we look on the right-hand side, 1 25th of a second is our proper exposure. Now, we could use our exposure compensation in here. I guess, first off, let's just take a photo. Baseline, we know this is a proper exposure. Let's go in with the exposure compensation and make this plus 1. All right, so exposure compensation is now at plus 1, and our indicator over here now says minus one. What it's doing is it's telling us that, well, according to what we wanted, we don't want it this bright. We want it one stop brighter than average. And so if we uh, go ahead and take another photo here, both of these photos are taken in manual exposure. This one was taken with the exposure compensation set at plus one. This was at zero, and the reason there's no difference is because we are in the manual mode. Uh, this is uh, exposure compensation designed to fool you. So it fools me, and, it's, and I'm looking at this indicator going, oh, I'm a stop darker than I wanna be. So let's go ahead and adjust this to get an even exposure according to the indicator, and i now taking a photo and the exposure compensation is really at plus one, and it's fooling the light meter. 
And so I think this is kind of a quirky little thing to do. And I would leave this at zero if you are using manual exposure most of the time. But as I say, you can fool yourself. This is, this is kind of the photographic equivalent of setting your clock five minutes fast so that you're not late. I like to keep things exactly where they are and know exactly what's going on. But if you do want to be that type of person who sets your clock 15 minutes fast so that you're not late, well, that's the way you can do it with exposures in this camera. All right, so that is exposure compensation. Next up, the metering system. So the metering system doesn't have a direct access button on this camera. You can get to it either in the menu system the slightly quicker way to get to it is in the I menu. So let me show you real quickly on kind of how to navigate and get there to this particular one. So we need to press the I button and we're going to go left and right to scroll through all the different options. And right down here on the bottom row, kind of this funky little pattern here is our metering options in here. And we can press OK in here and we can go through these four different metering options. I'm going to leave it on matrix for right now. And so that is how you find and set this. So let's talk about the different options for setting the metering system. First up, probably the most important, probably where you're going to leave it most of the time, at least that's what most people do with this camera, is the matrix metering system. This is going to be very good because it analyzes the entire scene. It breaks it all up into small areas and it's looking at the tone, the color, the composition, the distance of subjects in here. And it's really trying to come up with a final exposure that really takes into account all the highlights and shadow areas that you're shooting. In general, the matrix metering does a excellent job at getting you the right exposure. However, it may not be perfect. It may not work exactly the way that you want it to. So there are some other options. Center weighted metering is a very classic metering system. This was done on cameras for the last several decades. And it's basically looking at the light in a big middle portion of the frame. And this is where typically your subject is going to be. So if you're reading the light from that subject, well, this shows you where all that information is. And so it's weighted 75% to this small area or more medium sized area in the middle of the frame. If you want to be more precise, there is a spot metering option. Now this is much more precise. So if you wanted to read the light from a very small area in the middle of the frame, you could use the spot meter. And there are some people that really like to use this. I think it's a bit uh, of a more advanced system. And so you do want to be very careful if you are using this. You don't want to leave it on spot metering and just shoot general photography. That could really mess up your exposures. There's also a highlight weighted metering system where it looks at the brightest areas and tries to protect them from getting blown out. And that can work very well for some people in some situations. And so if you're concerned about blown out highlights, you might experiment with a highlight weighted area. It's good in, um, as I say, those special applications. But in general, I think for most people, the matrix metering is going to be the best general purpose type system that's going to be good for a wide variety of photography. One of the best ways of judging if you have the correct exposure is with the histogram. The histogram is this graph that shows you a little bit more information about, is it a proper exposure? It's more than that. It's, you know, how bright is the brightest portions are? How dark are the darkest portions? Where is most of them? What's really going on on this image in an exposure situation? You can do this and see this anytime by just pressing the display button. You might need to hit the display button several times in order to see it, but it can be very handy and it's as good as the exposure as your indicator for judging the exposure. Now, it's going to be kind of mounted up to the left if it's under exposure, mounted up to the right if it's over exposure. Now, this is something you can also see on images you've already taken by hitting the playback button and then using the info buttons, which is going to be this uh, multi-controller going up and down so that you can see this indicator. Now, if you try doing this on your camera right now, as you've maybe reset your camera the way I did earlier in this class, you'll say, John, this isn't working for me. And that's because we need to dive into the playback menu and turn on the histogram option for seeing this in the playback. And so we're going to turn this on in overview and RGB histogram so that we can see this histogram uh, 
with different colors. And that's going to show us all the different channels. Now, folks, I don't know why Nikon does this. It's always been a little frustrating to me, but they've, they've done it since day one. They have a number of features turned off from the get-go. And if you want to see these options, you got to go in and turn them on. And so we're going to dive in and make this change right now. And if you want to do it along with me, here's what we're going to do. We are going to go into the playback menu, which we haven't been into. It's the uh, very first tab up here on the top. We're going to go to the right and we're going to come down to something called playback display options. And this is, well, it's controlling the options when you're playing back. So we're going to dive to the right here and there's going to be all these check boxes and you'll notice they're not checked off. You can check them all off if you want. Uh, what uh, I definitely want to do is I want to check off the overview and the RGB histogram. And then I'm going to press OK, which confirms these settings and locks them in. Now, when I play back an image and I use the multi-controller here on the back of the camera to go up and down, I can see my brightness histogram and my RGB histogram, which shows me the different color channels and how bright or dark they are. Uh, just, for, just for fun here, I will take a photo that is two stops overexposed. Let's uh, get this brighter here by two stops and we'll do a normal exposure and we'll do a two stops under exposure. This is a uh, manual bracket series. Did I go three stops? I went three stops. Let's come back to two stops there. All right, let's play back these images and look at their histogram. So this is two stops dark and I'm going to use my multi-controller to go left to go to the previous image. This is a normal exposure. Look at those normal histograms. And I'll go left again, and this one is overexposed. And so you can learn a lot about your exposure by studying those histograms because they're going to provide you with really rock solid information about whether an image is really overexposed, properly exposed, or underexposed. And so that's something that's always great to check out in the field because sometimes it's a little hard to judge the image in the viewfinder or on the back of the camera as to how accurate it is. All right, something to note about this camera and all mirrorless cameras. The live view settings is a very important setting on here. Now, normally this is set on, which means that as you change your exposure, you can see it on the screen and in the viewfinder of the camera. And I find this incredibly helpful when judging exposure. Are you overexposed or are you underexposed? The image is actually bright or dark and you don't even need to look at the indicator or any of the controls to tell if you're getting a proper exposure. You can very much just look at the screen. It's not as accurate as some of these other settings, but it can be used. Now, there are certain situations where you do not want this happening. You want a steady state, optimum looking image in the viewfinder or on the back monitor of the camera. When you adjust your exposure, you can see your shutter speeds and apertures changing, you can see your exposure indicator changing. This is going to be the case with photographers in a studio using flash or anyone using flash photography, definitely, because your camera cannot predict what it's going to look like when the flash actually fires. So I would recommend leave the camera set to live view settings on, because I think that's a good safety setting for most people. But there are going to be situations where that is not working out for you and you're going to want to turn it off so that you just have a normal view through the viewfinder no matter what shutter speed and aperture you have set. When you do that, you do have to pay very close attention to the exposure indicator and your settings to make sure that you're getting the right exposure. And so we'll talk again about this when we go through the custom setting menu, but this is how your camera is currently set and one of the options to change it up. All right. Auto Exposure Lock. This is kind of a hidden feature because this button is not labeled with AEL, which is usually on a button on the back of the camera that allows you to lock the exposure. So that little joystick is actually a button and normally it is programmed as an auto exposure lock. You can go in and change it if you want, but let's go ahead and get this uh, kind of set up and I'll show you what we're talking about here. I'm going to put the camera into an aperture priority mode and I'm not going to worry too much about our shutter speed aperture combo. I'm just going to set, uh, here we are at f4 at 200th of a second. So if I was just to pan the camera off to the side where there's more darkness, 
you'll see that my shutter speed changed down to 160th, 125th, 100th of a second, and down to a 60th down there. And that's because there's a different amount of light over here compared to over to the right-hand side. If I wanted to lock in the exposure, I can press in on this button, and you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner, AEL turns on, and that locks the exposure in, and that locks me at 1 200th of a second, no matter where I point the camera. If I point it over here in the dark area, I can lock in that shutter speed of 125th of a second. So if you had somebody who was standing next to a very bright window, you might want to point the camera off to the side, lock in an exposure, and then move it over so that the window doesn't throw off the exposure. This is going to be useful in the semi-automated modes or fully automated modes like program, aperture priority, and shutter priority. Now, if you use manual a lot, you can reprogram this button to do something else because it's not going to be necessary with manual exposure. So if you do want to reprogram this button or any of the other buttons on the camera, you can go into the custom setting menu under controls and custom controls, and you can reset all sorts of buttons on the camera. And we're going to get very much into this as we get through this class. And so that's one of the first options to do in there. And one option that some people like is they'll do an auto focus lock combined with the auto exposure lock, but matter of personal preference, and we'll get more into that later on. Another way of making sure that you're getting the right exposure is to do an exposure bracket series. You saw me do a manual one earlier, but that takes a little bit of time. You can have the camera automatically shoot through a series of photos where it's shooting darker and lighter versions so that you can come back with a batch of images knowing that either one of them is correct or that you're going to use all of them for like an HDR composite image. So in the camera's menu system is a bracketing option in here. And you can actually bracket in many different ways. I'm talking about exposure bracketing, but you can do it with flash bracketing. You can do white balance bracketing. You can do something called active delighting bracketing. But we're mostly talking about exposure bracketing right now. And so this is where you can shoot multiple images at different exposure increments. And you can choose the number of shots. You can shoot two, three, five, seven, nine shots. And you can choose how much the exposure is adjusted between those shots. As I say, this is good in tricky lighting situations where you're not sure the correct light when you're out in the field. Uh, it's also good for people who like doing HDR composite photography where they shoot multiple exposures to make sure that they are capturing information in the shadow areas as well as the highlight regions. And so by diving into exposure bracketing, you can choose the numbers and the increments. Let's go ahead and do a bracketing series in here. Now you can work with this in a number of different ways with the mode dial. I like working with it in aperture priority because if you're adjusting something, you generally don't want your depth of field changing from one shot to the next. It's better to have your shutter speed change. And it's usually best to use uh, exposure bracketing on subjects that are not moving or not changing in their movie. You could do it like on a river that's moving, but I wouldn't shoot it on a person or a car walking across the frame, for instance. Okay, so let's go in and find the bracketing. It's going to be in the camera settings. And let's see if we can find this. There we go. Kind of deep in here. Auto bracketing. So I'm going to go to the right in here. And our first option is what type of bracketing do we want to do? We could leave it here. It's going to work the same as this next one down uh, because we don't have a flash involved. We talked about these other ones in here. I'll be honest with you, they don't get used nearly as much as just standard auto exposure bracketing for most people. Next up is the number of shots. And this is kind of weird, quirky. I don't know if they designed this. Uh, 0F means zero frames, but it also kind of looks like off with a missing F. Uh, in any case, that means the same thing. Zero frames means you're not bracketing and off means you're not using bracketing. So uh, we want to turn this on and we can do three, five, let's do five frames. That's what I do when I'm kind of serious about things. And one stop increments, we could do more than this if we wanted. That's going to be pretty serious. We'll do one stop increments here. So we're going to shoot five pictures. 
And you can see the little indicator down here, and it's got little, little tick marks below the zero in each of the ones and twos on either side of that indicator. And we're going to go ahead and lock this in and say OK. All right. So you can actually see this indicator on the right hand side as to where these are going to be. And this is handy because you can also use the exposure compensation. If you wanted to have this whole thing biased to the bright side, you could do that. Or you could have it biased to the dark side. I want to do it kind of straight in the middle. So we're going to go ahead and what we're going to do is I'm also going to turn on the motor drive. I'll turn it just on low here. And what's going to happen is I'm going to press down on the shutter release. And normally, with a low speed motor drive, the camera would just continually reel off shots. But now it's only going to reel off five of them. All right, here we go. Let's do this. Three, two, one, and go. All right. All five of them are taken. Let's review and take a look at them. We got the histogram turned on so we can see which ones we're shooting here. If you look down at the bottom, you'll see that we are at plus two on this last of the image. Let's um, get this way back here. There is our plus two, our plus one, minus one, minus two, and our zero. So if we go forward, our first shot was the normal image, and then it shot a minus two, a minus one, a plus one, and a plus two. And so that was our bracket series. Now, the bracket series is still set. I don't want to do it again. I'm done. I did my example. So I'm going to go back in here and I'm going to set this to 0F. I want to shoot zero frames, which means it is off. And so that's how you do bracketing. And that, as I say, can be handy in many different situations. A lot of landscape situations is where it can be quite handy to use. All right, next up is active D-lighting. Now, this has a little warning by it. This is only going to work with JPEG images, does not work with raw images. Uh, so if you are going to shoot JPEG, this is another way of controlling the exposure. And so what has happening here is when you shoot a JPEG image, the camera, even no matter what you've done with the exposure, kind of has the final say in the contrast and the tweaks and the highlights and the shadows and other little adjustments that can be made to it. And you can have the camera go in and make these adjustments for you. And so active delighting has kind of two goals in mind. One is to protect the highlights from becoming too bright. So it kind of hold those down. And then it's going to take the shadow areas, the dark areas, and it's going to raise those in brightness a little bit so that we can see a little bit more detail in those areas. And it can do this adjustment on different levels. You could do low, normal, high, extra high, or leave it in auto and let it figure it out according to the image that you shoot. And so here's an example of kind of a standard JPEG image versus turning on the active delighting at the various different settings. And you can see when you turn it on the extra high setting that it really tries to raise up those shadows. But the roll off between the highlights and the shadows doesn't always look natural. And so this isn't something that I would recommend leaving turned on unless you know that you've tested it and it's really right for you. This could be handy if you're doing a lot of people photos and their faces, the people that you're photographing might be in the shadows and you want to see a little bit more detail in there. You might leave it on normal or high or wherever else your testing says it's best. And so this is just a way for the computer of the camera to automate things and maybe make a better quality JPEG for you that you don't need to adjust later on down the road. Next up is high dynamic range. Now, high dynamic range is kind of like the feature we just talked about, active delighting. But this is where it's shooting two individual photos, combining that information to create a JPEG image. And this is going to probably do a better job of it. But because you are shooting two photos, anything that moves is not going to be a very good subject for this because it's going to be in a different place and the images aren't going to match up very well. So this is best done with the camera on a tripod with stationary subjects. When you dive into the photo shooting menu under HDR, first option here is you can either turn it on for a series of images where you're going to be doing HDR for a whole collection of images or for just a single photo where the camera actually shoots two photos. You press the shutter release once, the camera takes two photos, but then it saves it as one image. You can choose 
the strength. So how far apart are these two images that are taken? Now, if we look at the examples here, we can see what a standard JPEG image looks like versus some of the HDR images. Now, the greater exposure value range that you choose, the greater the two exposures will be apart, the more information it will be able to resurrect from the highlights and the shadow areas. But it may not look as natural as you like, so it really depends on the situation that you're shooting. You may need to do some testing in this regard. You can see in the histogram that shadow region, which is the far left part on that histogram, is being pushed to the right when you go to the 3EV HDR, and it's trying to save and resurrect the information in the shadows. Next up is the smoothing. Now this is, as I say, the transition from the highlights to the shadow areas. And we have some different options in here where we have low, normal, and high. And you can see in low, it's not doing much smoothing. And so there's this kind of abrupt change from the light areas to the dark areas, which in my mind don't look very smooth, but it depends on the exact scene that you are photographing here. So you may need to play around with the smoothing as well as the levels in order to get the right look for your image. Then you can also save the original Nikon electronic format images if you want to have those original images to work with individually, either to work with on their own or to create your own HDR image in a post-production software program. But in any case, you're going to end up with a JPEG final image here. If you do play around with this, I recommend saving those individual images because the camera's processing power is limited compared to what you have with software on most modern computers. And so uh, that's why uh, if you have those originals, having those raw files is always nice to have. All right, folks, there you go. Lots of different controls on the exposure. I think there's a good opportunity for you at this point to experiment and see which controls you like to work with. Make sure that you got everything fine-tuned the way that you want. Probably take some time and get those U1, 2, and 3 settings set the way that you like. And so I think you got your hands full of uh, homework on this section. So hope you enjoyed it. The next uh, couple of sections are also really important. We're gonna be talking about the focus settings and the drive settings, as well as the whole menu later on in the class. But uh, folks, this is just the beginning of a great journey into this camera. All right, we'll see you in the next episodes.